Hi, my name is David, and we're here to talk about multidimensional attacks using a, a few use cases. And we're going to explore Bitcoin, cryptocurrency, uh, we're going to explore a little bit of traditional banking, and then how to actually, uh, how it's evolving the threat landscape of using uh, the, the cryptocurrencies with the traditional uh, fraud. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jason and uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take some of uh, what David's talking about in terms of Bitcoin, cryptocurrencies, blockchain, and I'm going to talk about how cyber criminals actually take the money that they gain through their illegal activities online and talk a little bit about one, the traditional methods of how they kind of release that value back into their hands after it's been laundered but also talk a little bit about how you can also use virtual assets as well to, to use and launder that money, to place it, layer it, and also take that value back out. So Jason, what do, you, what do all these images have in common? Well, I think what they're doing is they're, they're bringing together different aspects of different types of cybercrime. So the first image we've got up, who is this woman? So she's a, and, and really, if you look at all of them, uh, you can leverage different social means of, uh, of attacking, which is what she's done. Okay. Uh, you can also uh, leverage uh, hacking. Uh, you can leverage espionage or, or uh, uh, surveillance. Uh, you can leverage uh, the ability to, to steal uh, information. Um, and you can le leverage uh, weaknesses within the attacks. Okay. So, uh, so in, a, in the real you know, situation, in a real war, mm -hmm. as in the... Uh, Battle of France, uh, you know, you, you think you have great defenses. Yeah. You think you have a really, really tight perimeter. Uh, but in actuality, you know, people, if they want to get in, they'll find a way. Because if I remember rightly, what happened was they, obviously we had the Maginot line, you know, supposed to be an impenetrable defensive line. You know, it had guns, it had men, it had everything. It had walls, um, big walls. It had everything. Yeah. And, but at the end of the day, the, the Germans, what, what did they do? They just ended up going around the thing. You know, they found holes through it, they just went around the end and actually just completely bypassed the defense. That's exactly it, right? They, they came through the, uh, the forest, actually. Okay. Which, uh, which they thought was a, a natural barrier of defense. Okay. Uh, so it was a mountainous forest and, and yeah, the Germans, uh, you know, penetrated through that line. Uh, and so it, was that because they, they thought they'd got everything covered and it was like they thought that it was going to protect them, this forest was going to protect them? That's or, right. I mean, what was the idea? That, you know, why did they just ignore it? They, they thought that no one would ever go through the, through the forest. Okay. It was, it was a little bit, uh, a very difficult passage. To, to take, yep. uh, but yet they were able to uh, come through that passage and uh, do a kind of a surprise the, the French and actually engulf them and circle them in, in, a, uh, in terms of uh, the war effort. So, uh, so therefore, you know, uh, they were able to outsmart uh, and outmaneuver uh, the defense system, okay? And if you look at also uh, cellular communication, and, and satellite phones. Everyone thinks that satellite phones yeah. are, are very, very secure. Uh, but uh, German University says, that, no, we've been able to actually uh, crack, crack the encryption, crack the codes. Okay. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, defense mechanisms that you, you put up, but are they enough? And I, th and I think that's like the, uh, the important point is like, you know, if you look at all of these images, you know, I, I kind of, I take the first one, We've got the, the social engineering, you know, the offer of like, you know, what's the lever on somebody, you know, yeah. and in this case, um, and then like, you know, and I mean, obviously that, that woman used that to find out information. Now, as I remember about the story, obviously there was, you know, it was charges of espionage as though it was uh, Russian espionage. But at the end of the day, um, it's not just like, you know, the national governments who are using this type of thing. You know, think about it as a, as a criminal. At the end of the day, you've got all these people and they need to obtain information. So they're gonna use social engineering. And what, and what better way to get some woman come along, you know, she goes to these places where she knows these cleared people are, and she knows that there's gonna be like, you know, so yeah. imagine yeah. there's, um, I don't know what it's called, the ACES conference that's coming up in mm -hmm. the US, the big one. Yeah. Um, 
So what, that, what in there, there's going to be a load of people who are totally into security. Yeah. But maybe there's some, you know, there's some woman or maybe there's some guy there and, and what he's doing, he's got like false credentials mm. and in reality, what he's going to end up doing is like, you know, he's there to obtain information. He's like, well, hang on a sec, who are these, who are the companies here I want to target? And, you know, if I'm going to, if I'm going to go up to them and like, you know, I use my social engineering skills, I can, right. I can get some information right. from um, that guy, you know, or that woman so I can find it out. So, so you know, I think, you know, that's, that's one of the important pieces is, um, you know, this combination of different attacks mm -hmm. um, and different methodologies. Um, A, to both obtain the information in the first place, but at the same time, it's like, you know, it's basically leading you down to a very specific, maybe, cyber attack. So, right. um, you know, what, who is this guy, by the way, with the headphones on? What's the, what's the story between that one? Because I, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to place some of these, these images and I'm like, well, hang on a sec. You know, the military one I get. Mm. You know, the guy with the headphones, what's his story then? Yeah, so that's, that's really about surveillance. Like okay. any, like any, any uh, crime, you're going you're gonna to case, you're going to listen, you're going to try to find out as much information as you can to actually uh, perpetuate and, and to, uh, to commit that crime. Okay. Okay? Because a well-planned crime is, is often executed well. Yeah. Uh, and uh, hopefully you don't get caught. Okay. Right. Okay. That's, that's the idea behind it. Uh, so, you know, uh, as in the case of whether it's a cryptocurrency uh, or any other information, whether it's for political gain or monetary gain uh, or uh, d defacement mm. uh, for other, other political reasons, um, it's, a, it's very, uh, very important to first gather as much information as possible, uh, then from that information, then begin the attack. Okay. So with the information, you can then go out and say, uh, uh, attack uh, certain pieces of the infrastructure, yeah. uh, utilizing vulnerabilities. But before, you may utilize social means to gather information before committing that to that attack. Uh, and that's, the, that's like open source uh, information gathering. You know, and you think about it, we're all hyper-connected now on mm -hmm. LinkedIn, we're connected on Facebook, Correct. you know. I mean, you even think about it, like, you know, so I, you know, I love running. And you know, I was I'm connected to Strava, which is like one of these running apps. Yeah. And I was like, I was on there the other day, and I was looking at some friends, and I'm like, oh my god, I know exactly where they live, and you know, just by actually yeah. just looking at their running routes over a, over a period of time, oh, yeah. uh, and that's all that's all sort of you know valuable information if you know if I'm an attacker, it and is. I'm kind of like, well, you know, are they are where they, are, are they? they home? Exactly. Are they not home? I mean, the, the recent government uh, news that came out uh, with the U.S. military, uh, they, now they banned the use of, of those, you know, exercise... Uh, oh, have they? I didn't yeah, know. I hadn't yeah, seen that story. They, they actually banned the use of them because uh, now, because uh, U.S. military would go out and, uh, and run the perimeter of their base. And through uh, GPS and geolocation, well, you, you know what, what the outline of the base looks like, and that's that's pretty horrible information. And you can, and you can pattern, you can get those patterns of like you know when people are there. That's right. You know, and I think like you know you were talking about surveillance, and obviously you know part of what my company does is technical surveillance, and yeah. you know and you know for some people they're like well, okay what what is that? And I'm I look at it and I'm like well okay um, Mission Impossible spy cameras, sure. spy bugs, trackers, and all the rest of it, and then. You know, some people were, were saying to me, well, that's got nothing to do with cybersecurity. And I'm like, look, um, you know, one of the things that um, we look for is that, you know, we're going into data centers and we, we look for basically like 4G modems. Um, we've got 5G on the horizon right now. And, and what that's going to do is create some massive bandwidth that if they can get a device into the, the network, into the server, you know, hidden in the bottom of a server somewhere, you know, it's got power from the server rack itself, um, it can definitely beam out data. And th there's been a number of attacks, cyber attacks in the UK, that have used um, 4G modems, they combined um, social, social uh, attacks, you know, to gather information, um, they put keystroke loggers on 
various like terminals to basically get the passwords, the, the IDs, you know, and then once they got those, they put that 4G modem into the back of a server rack. Um, and yeah, okay, the security, the security, you know, the SOC did identify it, you know, eventually, you know, it kind of, it did come up on the radar, but, but they managed to compromise all of those defenses by combining all those different uh, things. And imagine all the data that they exfiltrated from, from that attack. Yeah. Uh, and, it, and it really goes beyond that, right? Because uh, it doesn't, doesn't mean that you have to compromise that yourself. You can actually also, through social engineering, uh, convert somebody from the inside to be your accomplice, yeah. uh, for instance. Yeah. So there's a lot of ways of taking a, what it would be a traditionally a, a state attack against another country, okay. uh, but utilize it actually in organized crime. Yeah, definitely. I, I think that's a very relevant use case. Yeah. Uh, but also, how do, how do other, you know, right now, most of the attacks that are going are either state-based or organized crime-based. Okay. So they're quite sophisticated organizations that are leveraging all of the tools at their disposal, not just, you know, some script kiddies that are taking some tools off the internet and breaking into, into systems. Uh, they're getting much more sophisticated now. Yeah. And I think that's, um, that's some of the stuff we're going to touch on a little bit later in the use cases where, you know, part of the, the attack team is almost now broken down geographically, skill sets. You know, it's like, it's like the typical multinational. You know, you've got guys who specialize in phishing, you've got guys who are, you know, they're specializing in malware, you've got others who are social engineers, you've got people on the money laundering side and they specialize on, you know, washing the money and placing the money and, mm -hmm. and things like this. That's right. um, and I think the other thing that, you know, we need to really be aware of now is the fact that it used to be you used to know a criminal in your local town. You know, it used to be that there was some guy around the corner who dealt with dodgy stuff, you know, he sold stuff. But in reality now, with the internet, what you've got is marketplaces that are actually, all of those skills are like compartmentalized. You know, you need a certain piece for your attack team. Um, you can go into those marketplaces on the dark web and you can, you know, you can find them and then you build up those connections and you build out that team to have multiple skills. That's but, right. But, you know, I mean, what do you think though? Do you think the corporate is really ready um, for that kind of multi-dimensional, multi-skilled set kind of attack, you know, that brings it all together? Not really, not really. And the reason why, I think, is because uh, multinational or any, any corporation has uh, a lot of different compartmentalized functions, okay? Uh, and their goals are very different, okay? okay? Uh, and often, even the, even though you have a CISO and uh, a lot of security teams, there's still you know various responsibilities that are breaking up by these by these departments. So the desktop uh, you know administrators are managing desktops. You have server administrators managing servers. Network administrators managing networks. Uh, but in, in in concert, the the security is supposed to be an overlay on top of that. But it doesn't all work very effectively. Right? Okay. Uh, but a organized crime institution, uh, well, they're a very well organized group of individuals to commit fraud, basically, uh, either, either through, uh, you know, it all leads to money at some point or time or another for the vast majority of crimes these days uh, when it comes to cyber crime. Uh, even if it's political crime, okay, it still also leads back to money, right? Somebody is, is making money off of it uh, through the influence, uh, through law changes, through the malleability of, of what they're doing. So this um, next slide, it's all about attack methods. Mm. And you know, I know, this, is, I know this, um, this slide isn't showing us everything, you know, all the different attack methods at all, but what are some of the attack methods that kind of stick out for you? you know, what, what, what's something that you think right now is, you know, is hot? And you know, what are the things that we need to be paying attention to? Sure. So I think one of the areas that we should be paying attention to is phishing. Okay. Uh, you know, it's significantly harder to, I think, attack uh, an application or an operating system uh, or a database these days. Um, but it's sufficiently much easier to choose a software target and try to fish them or spearfish them. So identifying the target and being able to 
craft a well-crafted message uh, via an email, a fake website, being able to obtain their credentials, mislead them into providing the credentials to, to you in a, in a fake website, and um, then using those credentials to then uh, issue the attack. Um, so that is, that is one uh, fundamental area that is, is very interesting. Uh, I also think that there are other areas that we need to be focused on. Um, um, let's just stay on. Uh, just let's just sure. stay on, like you know, fishing for a moment. Sure. You know, because obviously, um, given my background, like you know, though I started out in cyber, um, one of the things that we were really focused on was the insider threat. Yeah. You know, uh, uh, and it really was like you know the weakest link in many aspects uh, of what we did when we looked at risk within financial services. Um, was really about the individual and, uh, and what they could get up to and, you know, and how they would, like, you know, make mistakes. Sometimes it was just a genuine mistake. Yeah. Uh, on other, other occasions, yeah. you know, obviously they've been cultivated, you know, they were part of um, some internal fraud and so forth. So, um, you know, I think when we talk about phishing, you know, from my perspective, I think one of the things that's happening is we're targeting some of the weakest link in our in our defenses. You know, it's a different set of skills though that comes to play when we talk about fishing. Though, I agree. So when you're looking at fishing, you have, uh, you know, basically you have to gather the information. Uh, then you're going to replicate some kind of uh, website uh, to to basically. Uh, think uh, to, to basically falsify and pretend that it is actually a, a valid website so that to show somebody right. that it is valid, yep. but it's not. Um, and there's a lot of different ways in which this is occurring by uh, utilizing domains uh, that are very similar uh, okay. and then uh, basically taking for wholesale the images and the, the branding of, of that website, often banking websites, um, but utilizing uh, potentially other um, other Greek alphabet characters as part of the domain name. So it's like a, an A with a, a, an umlaut on top. But you oh, okay. don't recognize right. yeah, the yeah. umlaut, right? When you're just yeah. uh, looking at the website and you may be searching for your, uh, for your banking institution and it shows up in the search results or you get email and then you click on the, the link and it shows up and you're like, oh, well, that, that, looks, that looks like my bank. Gotcha. Let me, uh, let me log in and and put in my username and password because it's it's saying if I don't do that, something will happen. So, uh, so we often get uh, fooled into thinking that it's a real website. We put in our information, and that and that bypasses and pushes it into a hacker's uh, database, and then actually that that information is is amended and pushed into the into the real database into the real website, uh, so that yeah you know, they think they've they've logged into the yep. real website. Yep. And, I th and I think, you know, that, that kind of mimicking attack, you know, that yeah. kind of copycat attack, um, you know, is like, you know, de okay, it's definitely out there, you know, it's definitely prevalent, it's definitely being used. Um, but I also, you know, one of the things that we used to look at as well was um, there was, say, like certain investments, for example, yeah. that, say, the bank used to have. Um, so this would be, so you would appeal to investors to say, Hey, like you know, here's a product of Bank Jason Wells, you know, and you would put it out there. It would have Jason Wells branding. It would have like you know exactly the same look and feel of the site. It was a completely bogus financial product, hmm. it, uh, and what it was was you know you would kind of sign up for the the prospectus or like, you know, to get some more information. And what you thought was like, you know, you would have to put in a lot of information. You would go, well, hang on a sec, that's actually like, you know, it kind of makes sense because it's a, it's a financial asset and stuff like that. So they need certain information. Whereas in reality, all it was was actually, you know, it's a, it's a, a copycat, it's a mimic. And then they're, they're just kind of using it to kind of gather that social information that's right. And then ultimately, you know, you kind of bang on the front end of it, you know, some form of false login screen, you know, to find more information um, that gets redirected into like the genuine, like, you know, login site. But at the same time, you know, what you may see is actually 
the investment information, the confidential investment information. Mm. So it's kind of, it's like a redirect. It's like, yes, okay, you do that. It gets sent this way. Um, but then actually you get served back like, you know, false information and you go, oh, okay, thank you very much, log out. Yes, you know what I mean? Yes, so yes. you see what I mean? So, yeah. Yeah, I, I see what you mean. So it's kind of like the, the Facebook personality test where, you know, it's basically using uh, a test to extract information because, you know, we're going we're gonna to give you a personality test and we're, or we're going to give you a horoscope. Yeah. That's an even better one. Yeah. Uh, but we need your birthday okay. to do that. And we need, uh, uh, well, of course, you know, to, to give you your horoscope, you need to give us your, uh, you know, your... Uh, either your children's names or your, or your wife's name or your husband's name. And after we get all this information, we're going to tell you which, uh, which sign you're under. Right, you know? okay. Uh, of course, you know. Uh, and this is a good way of, of extracting uh, more information out of, out of the, ultimately, the, the victim. It's a good job I'm not like into horoscopes then. Yeah. yeah. No, However, <laughs> my mother, yeah. my mother is always in there. Well, like, yeah, you better be she, careful. <laughs> <laughs> she sends me stuff and I'm like, uh, um, uh, mom, <laughs> you know, don't be, don't be entering that stuff. Like, yeah. you know, I don't want to get involved in this. Like, you know, um, forward this on a million times. Otherwise you'll have bad luck for the rest of like, you know, and by the way, you need to enter like certain details to, yes, be able to do course, that. Like, you know, course. and it's, and it's relying on human nature. It um, is. And it comes back to that insider threat. So, um, is there anything else on here you kind of, you know, we want to kind of draw out? Because I'm kind of looking at it and thinking, there's something else, that, um, or do we want to just go straight on to the case study? Uh, yeah, you know, probably one other, one other area okay. that would be interesting yep. is, uh, well, you know, a lot of people don't think about this, but, you know, you do have the insider that you mentioned. Yep. Uh, and a lot of people don't think about, well, how do you convert somebody on the inside to do something that they're not supposed to do. So it's okay. really developing an insider accomplice. So, and that's, that's becoming more prevalent for cryptocurrency okay. attacks. Uh, so it's really- And this is, this, is, this is somebody who's working inside the organization right. and has already got trusted access to the assets, that's you right. know, and the, the systems and the tools related to it. That's right. Is that right? That's right. Okay. That's right. So being able to convince somebody to actually commit a fraud. Okay. Uh, and and the, all these people can be tracked down via multiple methods. Well, you know. Like, you mean the people inside the inside the organization? Inside the, inside the organization. Of course, yeah. like because you have to contact everybody's like, them outside. Everybody's right? on LinkedIn right. anyway, like right. you know, and LinkedIn, they're like, "Well, I'm a startup." Social media, yeah. you know, yep. uh, Facebook, right? Yeah. Okay. Well, they all say, "Oh, I work at at you know this particular company." Uh, doing this particular job, uh, right. it's pretty easy to identify the targets these days. Yeah, okay. I think you'd agree with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah. definitely. Yeah. yeah. Uh, then it's a matter of uh, providing enough monetary reward for them to actually be an accomplice. You know, one of the, and this is, you might think this is an aside, like, you know, so <clears throat> if you think it's an aside, I do apologize, but, you know, I, I used to do corporate security in Dubai for a multinational. Hmm. And one of the things I used to say to people, they'd talk about these super sophisticated attacks. And I said, actually, there's an easy way to find out stuff in this office. And I said, there's all these cleaner guys who come in in the morning. And generally, there was a team of about 10 or 12 of them. You know, there was one security guard who would look after 12. They would literally split up all over the office, um, everywhere. And they'd be in every room. And on the whiteboards, there would be like, you know, the latest brand launch, you know, sales campaign, numbers, financial splits, you know, everything would be on the boards. And like, you know, and I would say, do you know how much these guys earn? You know, they would earn like such a tiny amount that in reality, if I was a corporate, you know, a corporate spy, like, you know, practicing the espionage, it would be like, you know what, why don't I give you a brand new S9 or like, you know, I leave you, a, what is it, iPhone 10 now? And, you know, and I said to them, that's a thousand dollars. But what I've given him is the ability to record. I've given him, you know, a fantastic camera that can like chop, crop, like, you know, take pictures of all those whiteboards, you know. So again, it's, it is, it is the, the insider threat, but it's not exactly, you know, what you're talking about, but these guys, you know, because I can give them something that they want and they have access, then actually I can get what I want to, to do that attack. I think it's, I think it's very relevant. Uh, in fact, I mean, why don't you just outfit them with glasses? 
they have a video camera in them and then uh, it might be a little bit too stylish a guy uh, wandering around with a, a rubbish bag and he's got these like google designer glass, yeah. he's got google or whatever google like glass, the latest yeah. thing is yeah maybe maybe something that is uh less obvious right perhaps there's a lot of uh, cameras in in glasses these days yep true uh and, and in this case it's not uh as obvious as somebody taking out their iphone and uh videotaping or taking pictures of a uh, whiteboard no? Yeah, no, 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 exactly. The pinhole cameras. I mean, pinhole like, you know, obviously, a there's a load of gear. And it, I tell you what, like, you know, because obviously that's one side of the business, but like, you know, those things are so cheap now, so easy to get hold of that actually I don't actually need to be like some state actor to, <laughs> to kind of outfit a cleaner with like, you know, a little bit of a secret camera or, or even to put a secret camera oh, yeah. in somewhere. And, and how long do batteries last these days with the lithium ion? Exactly. Right. Exactly. Uh, why don't Why don't we do audio as well? We could do audio. Yeah. Right? Uh, while they're cleaning under the table, because you know the, the under the table yeah, needs yeah. to be clean. Yeah. Uh, they just tape a little uh, video, like a, a microphone, uh, with a battery attached to it, uh, with a uh, I don't know, like let's say uh, a mobile a mobile phone. Yep. And now you have exactly. Yeah. Most of, most of those devices now are actually using. Um, mobile technology you know they've got mini sims in them um, that can be accessed all over the world and you know some of the things that you know we've seen uh, as Cyanexus is actually seeing that um, you know you can build it in say docking station though, though a lot of organizations now are kind of moving away from docking stations but you know it's kind of um, the office furniture well, like that you always find out. Yeah, you know, it's like yeah. you, you build it in yeah. and then you stick it on the desk. It's got a mobile transmitter built into it. And, and I can tell you now, um, I get him because I gave him the iPhone 10. I get him to take a picture of the desk. I look at all the furniture that, you know, the hmm. pencil case, the, you know, the phone type, you know, if there is a docking station. I get him to take pictures of that stuff. And then actually what I do is the, uh, as the corporate espionage guy, you know, I take that back. And then I go out to, you know, whatever the local, you know, computer hardware shop is, or now I just go online, but, you mm. know, I kind of do my reverse image lookup for a particular piece, oh, and then I bring it, and then I put my gear into it, give what it back it? to him, and I say, this yeah. piece of equipment, change it out, replace it with this. Yeah. He doesn't even need to know what I've done to it. Of course. Or Raspberry Pi. Yeah. You know, very, very tiny computers. Yeah. You can put them anywhere. Uh, and it's easy to identify the executive's office yep. to, to gather confidential information. Yep. Uh, so, you know, maybe, uh, you know, or maybe his secretary. Uh, I would say that, you know, the other, the other element is, is through surveillance, you could actually understand, if you understand who the executive assistant is. Okay. Well, maybe you just, you become very sweet to her. Yeah, yeah. Uh, when, you, when you look at that, you could, you could then... Uh, you know, a lot of times these, these EAs, they have access to, to well, the calendar. Yep. Right? Of course. Yeah. Uh, well, a lot of times they have to fix the boss's computer, so they probably have his password. Exactly. Exactly. Right? Hey, why don't, we, why don't yeah. we move on to, um, like, you know, the detailed case study we're going yeah, to look at. Because we've kind of, we've gone to spin round, like, <laughs> some of the general stuff yeah. and, and kind of talked yeah. about it. But let's look at a very specific case study now. Um, and kind of walk us through exactly what that's doing. Let's do that. Okay, so this, um, this first case study is crypto hacks. And, you know, I'm kind of looking at the slide and, you know, I know a bit, you know, obviously there's a fair bit I know about this, but, you yep. know, why don't we just kind of go over some of the pieces and kind of work through the slide and, you know, tell us what you kind of got here for us. Sure. So, uh, so as, as one, uh, well, everyone knows is blockchain is, is a very highly secure uh, type of technology that is leveraged for cryptocurrency. Okay. So, uh, so with that technology, we're able to take uh, and uh, have very strong uh, mathematical algorithms around it. Uh, we're able to distribute it in a way and build a consensus around it. Okay, so this forms the, the the strength of the overall underlying technology. However, there are a number of uh, elements in the ecosystem that are surround the blockchain right. and the cryptocurrency. Okay. Okay. Uh, and those are uh, exchanges. You have exchanges. You have wallets. You have uh, human targets. The human targets are ones that work within 
exchanges uh, within different parts of the ecosystem. Right. Okay. Uh, you also have procedural type elements. So in certain cryptocurrencies, uh, they have the ability to, to split, they have the ability to, uh, via smart contracts, be able to, um, uh, you know, have a certain amount of voting rights. So there's a, a and, and ways in which they, uh, they, they form, okay? Because the idea is to, is to have a, a decentralized uh, currency system that is very strong, very distributed, uh, and not governed by any single individual or country. But that's also, but that's also part of the, the, the weakness of it as no. well, you know, in terms of it being exploited. And, and what I'm not saying is that, like, you know, well, we need some kind of uber authority, like, you know, master authority yeah. who kind of sits <laughs> over every single blockchain. Yeah. Um, but I know the work that I've done with startups um, you know, one of the things that I came across was, you know, they had fantastic ideas, you know, highly technical, um, you know, and you were really like enthused and energetic and they thought up, you know, really good stuff. But um, I used to say to them like, okay, you want to scale up, you know, you want to take this to the next level. You want to explain why your particular product, your particular service is um, really good. Um, mm. But they're gonna, there's going to be somebody there who's going to ask you a load of risk questions. And you know, one of the things I used to do with the startups was, was actually go to them and play that person. And I say, okay, I'm an investor, you know, I'm the technical expert, some investors hired me um, to check out, do some due diligence mm -hmm. on the, the, the technical aspects of, say, you know, that particular product. Right. And um, you know, I'd often say to them, well, have you thought about this? Have you thought about uh, the compromise? We talked about human targets, um, you know, or the human element. Have you thought about, you know, what goes on in relation to the wallet? And I know you're going to talk about that, hmm. um, but often, in many cases, some of that they hadn't actually thought through. Not that they didn't have the technical ability, but they were so focused on you know the, this product and getting it out there and scaling it and marketing and you know the million other things that like you know startup does that some of those hardcore sort of security aspects and perhaps some of the non-technical security aspects they, they they really hadn't addressed and i you know and i think that's what you're going to kind of cover yeah, next yeah we're going to go over that so in terms of the overall ecosystem you have uh, the areas which actually contain the blockchain or the, or the cryptocurrency, um, those are the areas where it's, it's very weak, okay, okay. Uh, in, in many cases. And it's not because, well, it's, it's weak uh, because it's new, but that's, that's part of the reason why. Uh, because the banking institutions, uh, typical traditional banking institutions, well, they have a, a lot of governance around this. Yeah. Uh, well, they've been doing it for many, yeah. many, the, many years. Believe me, the policies <laughs> and the manuals yeah. in a bank are it like, is, you know, there's right? a whole tree. Uh, yeah. And, and so, as you can imagine, with any new technology, uh, there are sometimes weaknesses uh, in terms of, uh, well, the due diligence around the code. So in the case of some, some of the attacks on the exchanges, it's because of vulnerabilities uh, within the application code itself. Uh, some, uh, in some cases, it's the wallet. It's, it's where the, the currency of the individual user is, is held. So instead of uh, taking down and recording <coughs> the codes and the, uh, uh, in, in, in storing it offline, uh, you have a wallet that be, basically be able to make you uh, store that online uh, and the ability to, uh, to keep it there, okay? Uh, and be able to you know, use it into an exchange and be able to convert it into fiat okay. currency if yep. you like. Uh, so these these areas are just, uh, just yeah. fiat currency is real world currency. That's you right. know, and you know, forgive me, I'm not trying to insult anybody, yeah. but like you know, <laughs> you know, in some cases, like you know, I know like sometimes people ask me, they say, well, what the hell is fiat? Is that like to do with the car? You know, there's like, you know, the French, <laughs> yeah, the French fit. And I'm true, like, no, true. no, 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 no. Yeah. It's to do with like real world currency. Yeah, so, yeah. Like, yeah. Real, real world currency being uh, fiat currency, which uh, fiat currency is anything that is, is not asset backed by some physical uh, material, like okay. gold, yep. for instance, or diamonds or 
could be any anything else that has a store of value. Okay. Uh, U.S. government ditched uh, you know the gold back currency for fiat currency uh, you know several decades ago. Okay. Okay. Right. Because uh, I think they ran out of room in Fort Knox. And yeah, there's, a, the there's a lot of yeah, <laughs> <laughs> there's only such a big hole you need to yeah, dig like you know to right. back the you know the U.S. dollar around the world. That that's right. That's right. Uh, yeah, so, so one of the other areas of, of attacks uh, is the authentication system of, of some of these wallets and exchanges that people are using to hold their cryptocurrency. Right? Okay. Uh, and, and what are we what are we worrying about there then? Well, it's it's really worrying about how you uh, take and log in and authenticate uh, okay. into the, into into the system. Yep. Okay. Uh, and. How you how you can if you forget your password how many times do you forget passwords all the time right yeah uh, so, so <laughs> how many want... passwords do you have like <laughs> yeah. yeah I think at my last count I looked at like two hundred different passwords uh, and like right. you know user IDs too too many too many so uh, so a lot of these systems have used a uh, multi-factor authentication yep. system to be able to basically if you forget your password they'll do something out of bound which is to leverage your phone okay. and SMS. Uh, so what uh, what attackers have have now done uh, is they've attacked the authentication system. Okay, so by gathering a lot of information, uh, and, and this is called the port out scam. So they want to understand their targets first of all. Right. Let's, let's just take a step back. Understand your target. Well, you want you want people that have cryptocurrency. So okay. when you find people with cryptocurrency, yep. Well, cryptocurrency conferences, of course, right? Yeah. Cryptocurrency forums, people that say cryptocurrency in their LinkedIn, right? These are probably your targets. Okay, so you're going you're gonna to look at so, their... so we're doing that reconnaissance yes. like, you know, prior to the attack exactly. by, by kind of looking, getting to these conferences, by like, you know, researching them on LinkedIn, like, you know, looking for them on Facebook That's or right. whatever it is. You might even yeah. exchange business cards that probably have their telephone number. And, I, I, and actually, if we think about it, you know, we go back to that Russian that we mentioned, you know, hey, you know, let's go to a cryptocurrency, let's go make a fake ID, make a few fake business cards and, you know, just get out there and just collect as much information as possible. Absolutely, it can be done. Yeah. Business development. Yes. <laughs> Criminal business development. Yeah, it, is, it is development. Yeah. Because uh, you're developing uh, your, your profiles. Okay? Yeah. Uh, then you're going to take that and mm. continue to investigate and understand who they are. So you're gonna look at their Facebook. Yeah. Uh, you're gonna look at uh, a various means to, to identify that. Uh, the next thing you're gonna do is, uh, is you're going to, through that, start to understand, maybe it's, maybe it's through what we were talking about earlier, uh, spear phishing, right? Okay. So it might be targeting those profiles with some uh, interesting horoscopes. It might be something of interest to them uh, where you know, it might be uh, so check them out on, check them out on Facebook see what their interests are yeah. and then kind of you know tailor your phishing attack that's right. to like you know wow oh, this guy you know he's massively into schnauzers only because I have a schnauzer obviously yeah. but like you know, <laughs> you know he's massively into schnauzer dogs you know maybe it's a survey about like schnauzers that gives me that information that's right that's gotcha. right that's right, and uh, it could be you know. Do you have uh, family members that are also interested in schnauzers? Uh, do you uh, you know? Uh, what are some of the you know other details? So so by collecting this information, yeah, uh, you're going to create fake websites. You're going to enrich that data. So you have a, a set of data pool that you collect from one source. You continue to enrich this data, and then ultimately you start to then pretend that you are that person. Okay, and then you call up your, your uh, mobile carrier, the, the mobile carrier of the victim. Uh, you say, I am this person and I lost my phone on the bus right. this morning. Yep. Uh, and I need to port this number over to you know, my, my new phone uh, and give, you know, give me that phone number. And well, yeah, a lot of times this is what's happening. Mm. Millions of dollars have been stolen using mm. this method. Now, in other cases, you may, uh, you may through other other channels, also have somebody on the inside that you're working with to uh, obtain additional information to commit this fraud. So that's a that's another method of utilizing a combination of information you have. Yeah. Uh, in terms of 
uh, who has the cryptocurrency and then utilizing an insider who has access to be able to port that phone number over to you, right. the attacker, uh, then you are then able to get that number yep. and reset the, the person's you, you know, password for that application that holds the cryptocurrency. And gotcha. now you're able to transfer that cryptocurrency out yep. to another account and voila, you have committed a fantastic fraud. So we've done the reconnaissance. Um, we've, you know, we've obtained all that social information. Um, we've then got some insider, hopefully somehow we've impersonated them, impersonated mm. their identity yep. to allow us to reset the, the security over the, the, the wallet itself, you know, the, right. the, the electronic wallet. Um, and that once I've managed to do that, I'm then able to then access that wallet to then take out the actual, you know, the cryptocurrency and transfer it wherever I want. That's right. Gotcha. It's as easy as that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I need to go left and like, you know, <laughs> I'll be back. But yeah. So, so that's, that's kind of, you know, where we've talked about in the, the, the bottom of this slide, you know, we've looked at that targeting, surveillance, data enhancement, the, the SIM port, you know, is copying that SIM piece, and then finally the execution of the, the, the reset on the actual, like, you know, yeah. wallet itself. And, and it might seem like a lot of time taken to do all this. Yep. But the, the rewards are, are quite high. Okay. So if you put a lot of time and effort into this, Jason, I think, you know, you'll have a good payoff. Oh, thanks very much. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, that was Crypto Hacks, and you know we're now going to move on to our second case study and talk about what we're going to do next and sort of you know. And why don't you kind of give us a quick introduction to that? Uh, yeah. So uh, so coming up next, we're going to talk about uh, traditional banking uh, and how basically crimes are committed against the traditional banking uh, system uh, utilizing uh, Trojan botnets. Fantastic. Okay, we've got this picture of the world and it's all colored blue. Yeah. So tell me. Uh, yeah, so what this is going over is basically the Verizon uh, data breach investigation report, which is a very okay. well-known uh, investigation uh, cybersecurity report uh, that's published on an annual basis. Uh, so this is from 2018, uh, and what this says is there's more than 40,000 uh, botnet breaches, okay, uh, for the banking sector. Okay? Oh, just the banking sector? Just the banking sector. So not even, not even any other industry? No, no other industry. Wow. So this is really talking about how do botnets steal money from individuals okay. and transfer that to cyber criminals. Uh, so it's a, it's a quite extensive network of botnet breaches. I mean, if you think about the breaches, it's, well, that's just the breaches, right? Then you have the, the total, the total sum of the problem, which is probably a magnitude larger. Yeah. Right? Uh, so that's what we're talking about in this slide. Um, and you'll see here the, uh, the, the dark blue, mm. okay, uh, which is the United States. Yeah. Uh, has the vast majority um, or a very large majority of, of the breaches. Yeah. What, are, why, why is that? Like, you know, I mean, is it um, just because there's more people there or is it that Americans are, I mean, you're an American, like, yeah. yeah. Is it is because it Americans are more susceptible to um, this type of attack or, you know, so what's the story behind, like, you know, that? So I, I think there's several issues going on here. Okay. okay. Uh, so uh, number one, uh, it, it, I think in the U.S., there's, uh, it's a pretty successful country. We, we have yep. a, a lot of people that have a lot of money. Uh, so a uh, very, very good economy, a uh, large economy, large mm. GDP. So a lot of people that have money in their, in their bank accounts. Right. Uh, number two, okay, uh, the, uh, the, the issue is, uh, is we're not always, because we have a lot of protections in our banking system. If, mm. if money's stolen, well, mm. the government guarantees up to a uh, hundred thousand dollars that basically, yeah, you know, uh, the bank will, will repay that back. So there's a protection there. Yeah, there's so protection gotcha. mechanisms yep. uh, involved uh, for, for guarantees of the banking system. Yep. Uh, so that's, those guarantees are for, you know, banks closing uh, as well as other, 
other illicit activity. So we have strong guarantees, which also makes us uh, not have as much security measures in place. Really? Yeah. I yeah, didn't. I know. Really. I, I mean, I worked in banks, obviously, so I'm kind of like I know all the security measures, but I never worked in. You know, and most of the the colleagues I know who worked in U.S. banks, I know there's a massive amount of security in those organizations. They do have uh, massive amounts of of fraud detection. Yeah. Say. Okay. Uh, is is unparalleled. Yep. Uh, much better than Asia. Okay. Right. I would say uh, you you know they're looking at patterns or using uh, you know. Uh, statistical analysis, all sorts of creative ways to detect fraud and uh, be able to freeze it very quickly. But the weakness is, is in the uh, authentication. Uh, okay. Whereas we have uh, in, in Asia, yeah. uh, we have multi-factor authentication, not just on your phone, but if it exceeds a certain amount, you have you know, a token, a device, right. Uh, right, where you have to punch in some numbers and and it uses, uses mathematics to spit out a bunch of other numbers, okay? Uh, and sometimes you, you take uh, and you have uh, something that goes on your phone that you have to enter in that you have to then uh, leverage and enter into the, into the banking website to uh, move a transaction forward. Uh, a, lot of these, a lot of these don't exist in, in the U.S. banking institutions. So, so something like, you know, because obviously we, we've got two-factor authentication, like, you know, or multiple-factor, multi-factor authentication in a lot of the places I've kind of worked and, you know, and so sure. forth. So what you're saying is in some cases in the U.S., that type of multi-factor authentication doesn't actually exist. Yeah, that's right. Right. Uh, even okay. If it, even if it does exist. Yeah. Uh, sometimes it exists on your on your telephone only. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Rather than multi-channel. Uh, multi-channel utilizing a, a fob. So uh, so yeah. So that being said, uh, you know you have maybe you do have some kind of uh, SMS you get onto your uh, onto your phone, uh, but uh, quite often it doesn't it doesn't go beyond that unless there is a special uh, high net worth account potentially right. they add it to those. But in many cases, uh, it's just regular username and password. And occasionally it will ask you some, uh, to verify some secret information that you may have uh, about where you lived, uh, your social security number. Uh, oh, that just got hacked. Uh, there's a lot of information okay. out there on the, on the internet. Yeah, uh, yeah exactly. Uh, yeah, so, uh, so people will have that. Oh, well, you know, maybe maybe birth. Oh, well, that's on Facebook, isn't it? Um, so a combination of all these ah, different sites right? and uh, yeah. hacks, and you know, combining all that to d data together yeah. is actually what's filling out the profile of the attacker. That's right. Um, and kind of, you know, it's it's a rich it's a rich sea of you know information that's available that's now. That's right. So what are what are the you know from this slide? What are the the, the key messages that like you know people should take away? Uh, so a lot of a lot of the cases in this in this uh, area, okay, uh, botnets are looking for vulnerabilities, okay, and those those uh, uh, so that's how a botnet spreads. Yeah. So uh, so it's very important that you uh, you secure your network, uh, that you uh, quite often um, do your patches, your Windows patches. Uh, it's also very uh, very important. In my in my opinion, okay, to to change your your card numbers, okay, and certain other uh, information, um, because all of this starts to, to leak out over a period of time. So the less uh, the less you have all this uh, information that is that is stored with your card number and the last three digits and all these other things, which could be a way to uh, contact the bank and verify if it's you. Uh, you want to change these numbers relatively frequently. I'd okay. say. Do you I'd mean? Do you mean the pin numbers? Or the the uh, not just the pin numbers, but the pin number. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the pin number. Uh, the the credit card with the uh, the last three, the CCB number. Oh, so you're saying you're saying actually change the credit card oh, itself? Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Oh wow. Yeah. Okay. It's uh, not. No, it's definitely not something yeah. that kind of gone through my head. Uh, yeah. I mean, the other the other element is uh, is. Uh, ensuring that your your home network is is well protected because there's been a lot of compromises um routers okay. wi-fi routers yep uh a lot of a lot of issues with that uh also uh, the you know the the prevalence of iot devices coming in to yeah. home now yeah 
uh, personally, uh, whenever I have yeah, guests over, I have, a, I have a guest network, and then I have my regular network. Yep. Uh, so I know my own devices, I know I patch my devices, and I have antivirus, and I, and I do things that take precautions. Yeah. Okay? Uh, but I don't know when, when guests are over it, whether they take precautions or not. So I have, a, I have a guest network, and if I have IoT devices, they exist on that network. And if I, uh, uh, my other devices I use for my banking applications, yeah. they exist on a separate network. Gotcha. So that if something is, uh, uh, if there is a compromise on an IoT device, okay, it cannot leak over and potentially compromise my uh, home network. Uh, my home PC device. Yeah, and it's and it's about ring fencing, like you know, different parts of your home network. You know, from not only the the granular access control that perhaps you put on your you know your your device, but it's also about ring fencing different parts of the network as well. You know, meaning that there can't be leakage. You know, you know, as in security leakage or a security you know cross attack you know, between one zone, the next zone, and you can still apply those same principles, you know, to your home network as well, it, you know, if you want to. But I'm not saying everybody does. No, but, you know, not, not everyone but, wants to, but they should take simple, simple precautions. Okay, um, um, so why don't, we, why don't we move on to the next slide and um, like, you know, let's see what, like, you know, we've got to say about that one. I think so, let's do it. Let's do it. Okay, so, um, so this is like, you know, what we're describing here is um, a malware attack and we're kind of looking at the, 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 the sort of the flow of it. And, you know, as we're, we're kind of moving down through that, what, you know, just kind of take us through that. And, you know, obviously a significant amount, even though like, you know, I have a cybersecurity background, like, you know, a lot of the work I do now is around um, cyber and money laundering. Um, so I'm going to focus in on the money mule part in the next section. Um, but why don't you take us down through this pyramid and like, you know, and explain yeah. that to us. Yeah, so earlier we were talking about the, the prevalence, the, uh, the number, the sheer number, mm. uh, which is uh, 40,000 plus. Uh, over here we're talking about how this, how this occurs. So the, the malware uh, finds a vulnerability or, uh, you know, through a, through a phishing attack, somebody downloads a, a, an application or clicks on a link that they shouldn't click on. Uh, and through that activity, okay, uh, you know, for that cookie recipe that you must have, uh, but to get that cookie recipe, you got to click on this link, uh, or, or, you know, for that emails that say, uh, yep. in order for you to have good luck, you have to click on this link, okay? Um, these are oftentimes ways that the, the, basically the malware comes into the system. Yeah. Uh, and that malware sits on the computer and waits for you to access your banking applications. The moment that you uh, start to enter your banking applications, uh, it starts to recognize that that is a banking website and starts to record that information. Right. Uh, and, and basically being able to give the uh, attacker the, the information uh, and, and all at the same time, the potential if you do have SMS uh, type of uh, third party, you know, third factor authentication, multi-factor authentication, that will, you can also compromise that device as well. So in a very more sophisticated attack, you're gonna compromise the computer, the PC, you're gonna compromise the, uh, the, the, the personal telephone, the mobile, the mobile telephone to then create and have that identity. Now, that can be streamed across to an attacker that then leverages that to then transfer funds, okay? Right. Uh, so that, those transfer of funds um, will not usually go to directly to the attacker. That, that's, that'd be crazy, right? Because that would implicate themselves. Yeah. No, instead, they use uh, a third party transfer those funds first. And then from those funds that are transferred there, that, that's transferred back. So gotcha. there's uh, multiple levels of attack going on here. Uh, first, to compromise the, the PC, potentially the mobile telephone. Secondly, to uh, take that information, transfer the funds, and then from those funds, transfer to the uh, actual uh, uh, the attacker's accounts. Right, and this is and this is where we're seeing um, segmentation of the attack team. You know, from yeah. a skill set, a specialization perspective. 
Um, so, you know, we've got malware coders, you know, they're highly specialized. They just develop the malware and then they sell that online. And, you know, so, you know, there's the marketplace and, you know, I'm the developer, you know, I'm the designer and developer, but I may not necessarily be the ultimate user. Oh, that's right. Uh, yeah, because the dark web is full of, uh, full of these kinds of applications that you just, you just acquire. Uh, also, some of the identities uh, that have already been uh, stolen previously uh, can be leveraged as part of this. So you could buy the, some of the stolen identities, you could buy some of the applications, uh, and then you, you put a team together to uh, execute the attack. Okay. So, uh, so yeah, so it's, uh, it's very much like a, a company, an organization. Really. Yeah, exactly. I mean, like, you know, uh, uh, from, a, from a money laundering perspective, there's different parts of that money laundering network. Yeah. Um, you know, there may be the, the mastermind behind it. There's the suppliers that kind of supply different services. You know, and, you know, and it, when we look at a, a cyber attack, there are now people who are specializing in those different parts of the, the attack cycle. And, you know, and by that I mean like, you know, right at the very start, you know, you've got the reconnaissance guys, they're the ones who are taking the, the open source intelligence, you know, they're, they're analyzing it, mm. they're fusing it together to create a profile of the people that you then need to, you know, conduct the, the email phishing attack against. Mm. And, and I think that, you know, this is the difference that, that sort of, you know, as, as the, the organized criminal is um, advanced, you know, the reality is that they're, they're taking um, all of these different techniques, they're buying those services out in the, the, the marketplace, and then they're bringing them together to create a sort of a, a multi-skilled, a multi-faceted attack team. Um, and this is the, the thing that worries me the most about this is if I think about the corporate defenses in many cases, you know, and having worked in corporates, um, what I see is there's very much a segmented specialization within the organization. So I've got people who know cybersecurity. I've got people who perhaps know like um, social networking. Um, but at the same time, you know, the awareness of say physical, meeting cyber, meeting the real people, social networkers, you know, mm. meeting the intelligence people, I think for me, this is where those boundaries, you know, the, the, those kind of silos exist. And, you know, people are definitely, you know, people are definitely trying to um, break those down, but I still see that, you know, in organizations and, you know, a lot of the work I do is to try and break those silos to try and create that. Why don't we, we'll move on to the next bit now yeah, and um, like, you know, and see where we go next with this. Let's do that. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. So, um, what's the story behind this slide? Obviously, we've got a big old process here and uh, mm. it's banking mm. fraud. So, what are we thinking? That's right. So, so in this slide, it, it kind of breaks down the, the process into how the, the fraud occurs. Uh, so, uh, number one, uh, there's malware that is it's created. Okay. Uh, so, that is going to either uh, be a computer a vulnerability or somebody is clicking on something to install a some application that has a that has some kind of uh, uh, Trojan okay, okay. Uh, and that basically is is going to uh, infect the the victim's computer uh, and their the objective is to steal the credentials okay that is to say the credentials being the username password mm other information to, to basically access the, uh, that particular user's bank account information. Okay. Uh, then we're going to collect that information, well, not we, the fraudsters. Uh, then the uh, hacker takes that information and uh, is able to access uh, the remote user's computer. So, so not only do you look at the malware, uh, and the, the information that is uh, collected, but actually uh, the hacker mm. or the attacker comes in and actually logs into that computer. Okay, uh, that is then so the you know the IP address, uh, the, the 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 computer's uh, makeup, and the information that's in the web browser. Everything is actually the same. Yeah, 
actually the attacker is using the victim's computer. Ah, but maybe it's a little bit of a, a different time at night when the victim's on the computer, so he doesn't notice. Okay. Okay. Uh, then he takes that and uh, basically transfers that money to another account. So he sets up a, a transfer, goes to one account, from that account, uh, it ultimately uh, gets moved into a, uh, the, basically the, the, the fraudster's account at some point in the process. Uh, so this is what, this is what occurs uh, in, the, in the process to, to steal uh, the information. Uh, it's, it's a, a multi, you know, a lot, of, a lot of things going on in this tech. You have to identify, you have to identify the, the victims, you have to uh, get the Trojan there, uh, potential use of, of phishing attacks, uh, phishing emails, phishing websites. You have to have a, a code. Uh, it could also be exploiting a computer weakness. So there's a lot of there's a lot of things going on in order to to make this fraud occur. Uh, the, there's intermediaries involved uh, within a criminal organization, uh, and then the and then ultimately the the, the kingpin or the uh, uh, the person that, that wants to uh, make this this fraud occur. So um, so yeah. So this is this is what's happening. Yeah. In this, in this um, uh, and it's it's happening very very frequently. It's it's not something that is, uh, uh, you know, a, a small occurrence. But forty thousand is is quite a large. And that was uh, and that was back in the yeah. U.S., wasn't it? It was targeting U.S. Uh, financial uh, services. U.S., but not not just the U.S. I mean, the fraud occurs all, all over. Yeah, of course. A lot of fraud in. And for instance, Latin America, yeah. uh, South America, yeah, huge, huge amounts of fraud there. Uh, parts of parts of Russia, if we if we remember that map, um, and I suspect that there's more fraud uh, in in other countries uh, that's probably likely underreported. Yeah, and I think that's um, you know, it's definitely something that's going on right now. Is like you know, as with all crime stats. Um, the, the devil's in the detail. Mm. You know, it's like looking behind the crime stat and going, well, hang on a sec, which countries are we actually talking about here and so forth. But, you know, clearly it's a, it's a worrying process as we look through this, this, this process and we, we kind of get to the point of, you know, uh, compromising through the use of malware, um, the individual's credentials, their login ID, their password, mm. um, compromising their accounts. And then getting into that, you know, getting into their bank account and essentially like, you know, mimicking them uh, That's right. from the whole process. That's right. And, you know, uh, a lot of this is, uh, you know, is, is preventable um, in many ways uh, through, you know, antivirus is, is, is one means uh, strengthening the, the network. Uh, but in, in the vast majority of the cases, it's, it's just people need to be more educated on what to do yep. properly. Uh, to not click on certain things uh, that they shouldn't. Uh, but I think the banking, also the banking institutions have a, a larger role to play on ensuring the authenticity of those individuals are actually a, those individuals that are properly authorized. So there could be, uh, there could be some interesting uh, ways to prevent this from occurring. Mm. So we'll talk about that later though. Uh, shall we shall we move on to the next slide? Yep. Let's um, so let's talk about like you know some of the the money mule aspects of um, this and kind of how a cyber criminal takes his money, hmm. um, you know through whether it be cryptocurrency, whether it be, be through online fraud, identity theft, and kind of ultimately releases the back, the value back to them um, and gets their money out because that's the whole purpose of money laundering is, you know, okay, I've stolen the money, <laughs> but ultimately, you know, I do want to kind of do something with the cash that I've just stolen and not get caught. That's right. I mean, and, and stolen, it could be uh, stolen through, uh, you know, I would say uh, actual theft of the currency uh, or through some illegal activity. Uh, it could be selling drugs. It could be uh, uh, also uh, bribery. It could be a lot of different things to elicit illegal money. Uh, but cleaning along the way and in order to uh, try to remove the traces back to you. 
the end of the day um, to utilize that money for real goods, services, and what have you. Okay, so, so let's have a look at the, the money laundering process and you know, see how money laundering now is kind of interacting both in the traditional way, but at the same time is now using new sort of online assets, virtual assets, um, and using that as a mechanism, not only for placement in the system, not only for layering, but also in terms of achieving value as well. So let's, uh, let's get on to money laundering. Let's do it. So tell me about this, Jason. Uh, we have uh, on this slide money laundering, uh, and it looks like you have a three-stage process. Let's, let's go through that. Can you take me through that? Yep. So, I mean, as we go through money laundering, I mean, this is very traditional. Hmm. Um, so it's kind of the, the money laundering process has not really changed over the years, you know, the general stages and how we understand it. Um, what has changed, and we're going to cover that a little bit later, is, you know, the way assets are placed, the way that they're layered, and the way that value is kind of extracted out of the whole process. So as we look at stage one, you know, generally in classic um, money laundering techniques, um, this is about the, the money launderer, you know, the accountant, you know, so if you, if you watch Netflix, there's Ozark at the moment, which is a, it's a series about a guy who's a money launderer. Um, the classic one, Breaking Bad as well, like, oh, yeah. you know, Saul. Yeah, like, that's you know, right. That was fantastic. He, he, he's, I love that show. <laughs> he's, a bit of, he's a bit of a fixer, but these are great yeah. shows. Like, you know, if you want to learn about money laundering, get a car you know, wash. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, get yourself a car wash, get yourself a nail salon and all the rest of it. Yeah. So the first part is, though, um, let's take our cyber criminal. So yeah. he's, he, he's committed online fraud and somehow he now needs to release that value because he's got the money in his hands. Um, and the important part is now, okay, I've now ultimately got to get it out. So stage one of it in the classic model is called placement. And placement means using different channels to get it into the financial system. So in this case, as you can see on the slide, we talk about cash, we talk about bank accounts, and we talk about virtual currencies. Yeah. And we're, we're going we're gonna to pick out virtual currencies in uh, you know, the next section and sort of you know, look over that in a little bit more detail. Um, second stage, this is the, the layering stage. That's kind of the, the, the classic term for it. Um, this is all about masking what happens. It's confusing the authorities. It's about confusing the financial system. It's about putting in multiple layers hmm. of movement, um, multiple people touching upon it, multiple organizations, multiple accounts. Because every time um, a piece of uh, illegal money, like, you know, or like, you know, um, something that comes from a crime, yeah. has got to be put through a number of different stages. Because each time it adds like friction. It ah. adds like confusion, yeah, yeah. camouflage. I see. Yeah. So, so like, uh, like what Paul Manafort did when he took some money from some oligarchs yep. and uh, put it into an account and then took the money out of that account and said it was a, maybe a loan. Yep. For you know, he just, he, he basically, you know, he's taking that money, he's calling it something else. So, <clears> you know, when you make a transaction, um, a significant amount of that money is um, you've got to state what it's for. Hmm. So they talk about things of source of wealth, source of funds. You know, so where does you know in this case um, Paul Manafort, like you know, where did all his money come from? Source of funds in this case is you know, well, where did that money from the oligarch come from? Yeah. And so banks will look at that, and those are the typical questions that they'll ask about. Now, what they need to do if if I'm the money launderer is to disguise that. You know, I need to, I'll call it something else. Mm. Um, I'll make false invoices. I'll do trade-based stuff. So I'll, I'll sell stuff, ah. you know, um, I'll over-invoice, under-invoice. There's multiple ways that it's used. So like shell accounts. Yeah, shell, shell accounts. A lot of banks now don't, like, you know, they, they sell company, uh, shell companies. Mm. Um, don't necessarily want to do business with them because they're quite high risk. Mm. Some still do, you know, and obviously some jurisdictions. Clearly, you know, it still exists, still used, still open accounts for, you know, because there's legitimate reasons why shell companies actually exist. Of course. Yeah. 
Mm. Um, so, so that second stage is all about camouflage. It's all about confusing the authorities. It's all about making sure that if somebody is watching, monitoring those transactions, that actually um, it's hidden, it's disguised. Um, so, and then obviously the, uh, stage three is, you know, this is the good part if you're the criminal, this is where I take the money back out. Oh. You know, this is where, you know, I've gone into all that work, you know, as a cyber criminal, I've committed the fraud, um, I've kind of stolen the Bitcoin, somehow I've got to get out the value that, you know, I've just taken. Um, and we're going to go into a little bit about that and I'm going to focus, you know, just look at a few examples of, you know, how you take it out. And hopefully um, that'll help people in terms of understanding exactly what they perhaps are looking for, you know, and movements um, in terms of that. That's, that's interesting. So, you know, uh, the last stage is where you get the Maserati. Yeah, yeah, or, exactly. Or the, or the, the, the peacock uh, coat or something. Well, and, uh, <laughs> you can wear the peacock coat. I'm not wearing uh, the, know, I'm not wearing the peacock know. coat. I don't know. It's, it could be a major fashion statement for you. Okay. Yeah. I think that's on your plate. <laughs> yeah. Right. Okay. So, so let's take stage one and kind of take it like, you know, into a little bit deeper right. and kind of connect it back up with um, blockchain and crypto um, because there's, this is kind of the new way. There's old ways and new ways. Absolutely. Let's do it. Okay. Okay. So stage one is is all about the placement um, stage. Now traditionally, um, it was it was about putting cash into accounts. You know, you would uh, you would have people who would come along, um, and in some cases, big bags of money, they'd plop it on the table, like you know, the teller, and say, "Yep, here you go. Here's the the nice briefcase. Got a load of money. I need to put it in the account." Um, now, still goes on massively. You know, don't get me wrong. Like you know. Believe me, the old methods uh, are still there. You know, there's no point in breaking it. You know, Tried if it's working. True. So, um, cash is still big. You know, bank accounts. There's lots of ways now to get value into the system, and we tend to use the word value now for um, illegal gains because there's a massive amount of ways that you know you kind of can achieve that. It's not just in one dollar bills, ten dollar. You know, there can be assets, you know, stolen, it can be anything, you know, and that's, and that kind of leads us on to um, mm. cryptocurrency and kind of how it kind of can A, be stolen. We talked earlier about um, cryptocurrencies and how it could be stolen out of the account, how like, you know, I, I'm spoofing the reset of uh, the, the wallet so mm. I can then kind of transfer that money. That's right. Out. Yeah. So one of the things that's definitely up on the, the regulators and the authorities' eyes right now is, you know, cryptocurrencies, crypto wallets, crypto exchanges, and, you know, it's, it's a major concern for a lot of organizations. Mm. And part of that problem is, you know, and we talked about this uh, previously, is where the regulation that's kind of set over the top of these these organizations that are you know handling cryptocurrencies mm. um, they're brand new financial services yep and whereas a bank has most probably been in the system for 20 30 40 50 100 years whatever Long it may term. be Long term, yeah. and you know the the rules and the regulations about that organization have been well established you know mm. there's been incidents they've been tightened up they kind of put in place new technologies. There's, you know, there's a whole industry behind ensuring that the financial services is not used for, for money laundering or it's not used for bribery um, and so forth. So, True. So, but things change, you know, and we've now got those, the, those cryptocurrencies out there. And, and part of the problem is that those cryptocurrencies have a, they don't have as much regulation uh, around them. Sometimes security, um, okay, the blockchain, we talked about the blockchain being very secure, but we also talked about the pieces around the, um, the administration of that blockchain that, that isn't as secure as it could be. You know, sure. the, the, the people involved, the administrators and so forth. Yeah. Um, and, and that is something that, that needs to be considered. You know, so for example, you know, uh, a few years ago, um, Monero 
you know, the value of Monero shot through the ceiling. Mm. And, you know, there was a massive amount of commentary in the press saying, well, hang on a sec, you know, this is criminals. Criminals are using Monero as the, you know, the criminal currency of choice. And they were using um, exchanges um, to kind of transfer that value, to pump up the value as well, you know, as they kind of transferred real world currency, dirty money, yeah. into different channels. Um, and then put it out into um, the system. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's uh, definitely it's a it's a currency or financial system that's not highly regulated uh, across many jurisdictions, and uh, therefore it's prone to things that used to happen to financial markets mm. uh, previously, like uh, like news that would inflate or deflate the currency to affect transactions. Uh, so if you can inflate, you know, some kind of financial instrument, then you can take those gains before, well, before anyone else can take those gains uh, and exit while everyone else loses. So yeah, so it does have a very unique and interesting flavor uh, today, but it's also something that can be uh, uh, movable uh, across different exchanges. Uh, so it definitely has its unique challenges. And, it, and it's all part of the same process. In essence, it's just a, it's another series of technology that, that's now available for me as a money launderer to kind of move my cash around or move my value around the system. Um, and, that's the, and that's the important part. Um, you know, I, I put PayPal up there quite deliberately. Um, one of the problems with PayPal was with social security numbers that were stolen. Um, it enabled um, false identities to be created using those social security IDs. And it was those PayPal accounts which were then used to, to push money through the system. Oh, yeah. You know, and, and, and that's, you know, it's, a, it's an important thing to understand is all this is is just a more modern technology. Um, but the controls that you would traditionally see within, say, the, the financial system within an account, yeah. you know, as kind of a fiat currency, you know, um, cash over the counter to the teller. Um, know your customer details, um, due diligence, um, risk assessments, all of those things, the speed of a, 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 a transfer within the cryptocurrency world doesn't necessarily lend itself to those type of checks, you know, those detailed checks. True. Um, some people would say that, okay, well, it's technology, surely we can use technology. Um, but I'll tell you now from experience, the reality is uh, the technology that you use to monitor transactions, to check on sanctions, um, violations, and things like that, there's always somebody who sits behind that technology who generally will be you know, kind of filtering it. So the system kind of can throw out, you know, thousands of transactions Indeed. That, that might be suspicious. But the problem is that those thousands of transactions then need to be filtered, compared, um, looked at from a, a customer information perspective and so forth. Like, you wow. know, so, it, so it's, it's not as easy as somebody just throwing technology at the problem. That's true. In a lot of cases, in a traditional banking uh, institution, you'll have people that will, will look at cases of fraud uh, within the system, uh, within the bank, at, at the very least, uh, and be able to you know track it down uh, throughout the throughout the network. Uh, but the the mere fact that it is a distributed ledger system uh, that exists everywhere, uh, in in many kind of ways to explain it. Uh, but exists in many places in a distributed way uh, that there's no centralized institution. So that when there is fraud, uh, it, it, there's very little, you know, uh, there's really virtually almost nothing that you can do to actually go back and get your money back. In some cases, uh, uh, fraud has com been committed on the, on the virtual currencies such that People had to had to fork the uh, uh, the cryptocurrency, and money is uh, is uh, is you know you can either you can either gain it back or it's lost forever. Uh, in other cases, it's it's frozen in time. 
And think about, okay, think about the legal implications as well, okay? So, <coughs> of the distributed ledger, okay, so if, so if there's a crime committed within that, you know, within that, that purchase, you know, which legal authority has, you know, a jurisdiction over that, which regulation applies and so forth. And, and, that's, and that's something that, you know, regulation around um, cryptocurrencies is changing dramatically. You know, there are third parties now who, who are, you know, they've been in the due diligence business a long time, know your customer business a long time. Um, but the problem is that actually a lot of that is not yet incorporated into some of these technologies. There are, don't get me wrong, you know, there, there are cryptocurrencies that, you know, they, yes, there's trust involved, but at the same time, you know, if you're in a banking situation, there's somebody who, if you have a question about a customer who owns some value, an asset, um, you know, in this case, say, uh, sure. dollars or whatever it is, there's a relationship manager or somebody yeah. who can call somebody up and go, hey, um, by the way, you've just made a transfer of X, Y, and Z. Um, you know, I'm kind of, what was that for? Where was that going? Who, you know, what was that? You know, what, what's the value? Have you got some backup for that? You know, like an invoice if you're a business and so forth. But, you know, do we think that all goes on around cryptocurrency? No, I mean, I think that Cryptocurrency does have a have a place, um, and at the same time, well, I mean, how how good were traditional banks when it came to technology in the early days when we had, you know, online banking uh, or other other forms of uh, really banking fraud? I would say, uh, yeah, one would one could argue though that cryptocurrency has has evolved very rapidly with additional security controls faster than traditional banks have had to deal with. So and, and it'll be interesting to see like, you know, how it, how it, it develops. Certainly regulation historically has taken a, a long time to catch up with um, technology movement. Yeah. Um, you know, naturally it's understandable, you know, technology, bang, 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 you know, it, mm. it moves very quickly. It does. Um, but regulation is, is not necessarily like, you know, as fast because yeah. obviously it's got to go through so many like different checks and consultations and then eventually gets brought into law. Um, mm. Let's have a look at stage two. Um, and this is about the layering process. And this one I'm going to talk through um, a, a particular case. It was a, it was a Russian case that the, um, mm. one of the authorities um, uh, has used, somebody called FADEF and uh, the Financial um, Crime Action Task Force. And let's see, like, you know, an example of, you know, a particular case, and it kind of illustrates how money mules are used within the scene to, to move money and where they're using online wallets. Um, they can use cryptocurrency, they can use debit cards, and so forth. Wow, it's getting very exciting. <laughs> can't wait, let's do it, let's do it. Let's see. All right, so uh, Jason, uh, looks like this next slide is, is the stage two that we talked about. I think um, this is going to be very interesting. So tell us what you have. Tell us about this slide. So this is a particular example. So stage two is all about layering the money. Uh, and this is the, the process of, of really camouflaging it in the system. Because, you know, the more I can camouflage the money, the more I can dilute the, the traces, the, you know, the tiny financial footprints that I leave behind, um, the harder it is for the authorities, the financial services, um, the investigators to kind of get hold of me, um, to find, you know, what I've done um, and to kind of trace the, the chain. Um, so if, if we look at the slide, what you're seeing here is three different ways of like, you know, how you can potentially layer it. Um, in the first case, we talk about trade-based money laundering. Now, here in Asia, you know, we're obviously both in Singapore. Mm. It's, a, it's a major concern in Asia. The amount of sea freight and, you know, with the opening of the new Silk Road as well, if you think about all of that trade, um, trade is a great way to, to launder money because I can do a number of different things. Like, you know, I can over-invoice, I can under-invoice, um, so I'm transferring value and I'm disguising it in certain ways. 
Um, I'm not going to go into like the details of trade-based money laundering because we could be here for a very long time yeah. talking about it because there's a whole range of ways that you can do it. Um, other things, tax havens, um, mm. shell companies, um, correspondent accounts where you don't actually even know who is truly you're dealing with. Um, a lot of banks now won't even use that, that those type of accounts. They won't deal with those type of accounts. Mm. Uh, and the reason being is that they're they're high risk vehicles. They're, yeah. you know, it's a channel that presents high risk to an organization. So, you know, I, I'm not gonna use those. So the third one here, and it talks about money mule proceeds stored in virtual currency. And, you know, I'm gonna walk through this. Um, it's a case study. It's just been released as part of um, a white paper or some guidance issued by FATF. Um, and you know they're the uh, the authorities who provide advice about money laundering, and you know they kind of give guidance on um, how people do it and yep. so forth. So they've just released a good guidebook that's you know it's worth reading if you want to learn about well, it. What about the vitamins on the top of the vitamins? That's drug. That's like you know that's oh. a, that's a drug market marketplace. Oh, it's not it's vitamins. Oh, I thought but it was yeah, vitamins. you're clearly you know you're vitamin way C, too behind. Yeah, vitamin D now. No. So, no, oh, yeah. however, <laughs> vitamin D, trade-based money laundering, oh, yeah. um, you know, because if you think about medical, um, like pills now, um, it's a mixture of stuff, okay? True. So the value that I place on that can be determined by my marketing, it can be determined, so one pill, you know, it could be $100 because I've told you there's gold in it, there's, you know, yeah, yeah. the extract of the rare Yeti musk or whatever it is, mm. who the hell knows. But the point being is I can assign um, uh, a value that's determined by me, that's not right. necessarily the system. Sure. Um, so, you know, in this case, you know, this particular case study was all about um, a, a takedown of a Russian organized uh, gang and what they did is they had a drug market, an online drug market was available on the dark web and you could pay for it via fiat currency or you could pay for it by cryptocurrency um, and you were using electronic wallets to, to kind of buy those drugs. Oh wow. So, so you're the criminal. Um, Do I have to be? Can't you be the criminal? No, 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 no. I no. want to be the, I'm the guy. I'm the, I'm the guy fighting the crime. Oh, okay. Like, yeah. All right, so I'll be the criminal. Okay, okay. <laughs> um, so, you know, basically, like, you know, we were selling. They were selling drugs online. Uh, they gave a different, uh, a number of different options to actually pay for that. Mm. Now, obviously, they've got to get that money out of the system. So the guy in the middle is obviously, he's the soul of the, you know, this whole scheme. Oh yeah, you know, yeah. Looks he's like the, um, the main character in Ozark. Yeah. You know, um, he's got to take the money, the illicit funds out of that system and somehow get them you know, ultimately back to the criminal. So in this case, um, the Russian authorities, you know, they had a look at it and, and what they were using was uh, technically a form of money mule. Um, so in this case it was students. So what these students were doing is the students were opening electronic wallets, you know, electronic accounts. Um, and they were also getting debit cards or cash cards, you know, slightly different, you know, obviously putting value onto, onto a cash card. Um, but then what they would do is they would then sell those to the money launderer, mm. you know. So they sell those to the money launderer, and this is like selling uh, a tool. Mm. You know, it's a tool for the money launderer to place and layer the money into the system. So now some of those money mules, um, it was just a service. Yeah, can you open me account? You know, and they would be like, yep, yeah, no worries. I'll open you an account because you can't do it in my country or whatever it is. Um, and they would take a, a flat fee, you know. Yeah. Uh, you know, that's one way to do it. You know, you kind of give me, you give me that, um, that tool. Um, the other one is they take a percentage of the transfers that are made for them. So commission. Yeah, I'd like to yeah. sign up for that one. No, no, no. And, and do you know something? <laughs> you know, that is the, the common way it works. You know, yeah. it's a case of work from home, um, earn money just for sitting there. Oh, I've gotten those emails. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, you know, and you yeah. think about that now, the difference is I used to have to in money laundering, 
I would eventually find people, you know, somebody would say, oh, there's a friend, or I'd go hang out in um, universities, or I'd go hang out in bars, and I'd find somebody who needed some extra cash, yep. um, you know, or, or was those sort of gig workers, and I would say to them, hey, like, you know, um, yeah. you want to earn a bit of extra cash? You've got a bank account, right? Um, you know, sometimes I need a bank account in this country, and so forth. The difference is now, um, with the cyber world, is the fact that actually, you know, I launch an email, mass email, out of like, like a Nigeria scam. Oh, yeah. You know, and I kind of bang it out there and I kind of go, hey, you know, you want to earn some extra money. And I send that to 200,000 people. And of those 200,000 people, I'm hoping just a thousand of them, you know, around the world will kind of go, hey, this sounds great. Like, you know, I just need a bank account. Uh, you know, I've got to be over the age of, say, 21 or whatever it is, work from home. And, you know, that automatically gives me a channel. And what I do is I mask up my, my placement, my layering of the money in a way that you think it's legitimate business. You know, nice. you get paid 10% over the top and you're like, hey, this is easy. All I'm doing is money comes into my account and it goes out to another account and I just, all I have to do is just kind of put the transfer details in. Um, and I can mask all of that in different ways as well as the, as the money launderer. So in this case, you know, the students mm -hmm. as the mules, yeah. but you know, they gave the tools to the money launderer. Um, then the money launderer takes the, the, the funds from the, the marketplace, the, the dark web mm. marketplace. Then what he does, he then goes, okay, I now need to throw all of this, I need to wash this, put, push this through lots of different channels, different accounts, different currencies, you know? And this is where you kind of start to now, you know, bear in mind, you can actually still do all of this electronically. This is all done, you know, over the computer now. Um, but at this point, if you then start to throw in what now we've got in terms of cryptocurrencies, and crypto exchanges, all that is is just another form of a way to, to wash my money. So I find myself a wallet, I find myself an exchange, mm -hmm. you know, I find mm -hmm. myself cryptocurrency which I buy, I then sell, I then send it to somebody else, I buy from somebody else. Yeah. And in fact, all of those pieces may all be part of my own network. And in this case, you know, it passes through the system, um, and it eventually will come back and be consolidated. And in one of your slides, you know, I think you talked about these consolidation accounts. Um, and as it comes through, um, I then got to get that value out. And I take that value, and it can be in cryptocurrency, it can be in fiat currency, as long as I can get it ultimately back into the real world, that's what matters. Yeah. Um, and that's what they're doing. They're using cash cards, they're using debit cards, they're using goods, and, and that's something we're gonna talk about next. Um, some research that was done quite mm. recently at the end of last year and kind of was briefed this year ah. at the RSA conference um, about how cyber criminals are using you know, their illicit funds and how they get them out of the system. That's very interesting. So let's move on to um, how they get it out of yeah, the system. let's do it. Yeah. Okay. Um, this is kind of the final stage of the process. So this is actually the good part if you're the criminal. This is where you get the stuff out, like, you know, and make the most of it. And um, so in this stage, what we're doing is, you know, we've placed it, so we've got it into the system. So maybe we've exchanged that for cryptocurrency. We've washed it through by layering it through um, different exchanges, different wallets. Um, different types of currency as well, you know. We could actually, you know, push it into crypto, bring it out of crypto, you know, into real world, and then push it back into crypto again. Um, it doesn't make any difference, and, and that's the whole point. And I suppose yeah. some of these people are unsuspecting. It's like, let's say you use that Trojan botnet to compromise somebody's account, 
uh, then they, you can make them a, a mule without them even technically knowing. Yeah, you know, you steal their identity yeah. and you kind of, you know, you cr use that identity that you've just stolen to create accounts that can be used as part of a money laundering network. Wow. And, and that actually, to me, is part of the scary stuff, like, you know, is the fact that, you know, you think about it, I was like looking at my password accounts, like, you know, uh, and I was thinking about, oh my God, how many online identities have I actually got, like, you know, for various things? And sometimes you just forget about it. Um, yeah. So, so you could be essentially an accomplice without even knowing. Yep, definitely. Yeah. So people are pointing the finger at you and well, you have no, no idea what You'd have no idea. What's you know, going on? it'd be like, yeah. huh? What do you want about? How come I've got a bank account in like, you know, yeah. you know <laughs> this country or this state or yeah. like, you know, and whatever it is. And it's beyond even uh, bank accounts and loans and credit cards. It's about opening up accounts in cryptocurrency that you didn't know existed yep. to wash somebody else's money. Online shopping centers, oh, yeah. uh, you know, and stuff like that, you know, because somehow I need an identity that's got a legitimate, um, like, you know, aspect to them, yeah. you know, so it looks all real. Um, and somehow, if I can use that identity, that account to then acquire value and move value, then actually that's what helps me. So, so in this stage, now this research came from um, a study that was done at the end of last year, start of this year, and um, a doctor from the UK, one of the UK universities. Um, he kind of, you know, he did some research into how cyber criminals um, were, were kind of releasing their value. Yeah. So, so in the first part, um, what he discovered was that 15% of the proceeds that they had was actually just on the basics. Huh. So this was buying your groceries, paying your shopping bills, you know, cable TV, Netflix, yeah. whatever it is. Everyone needs you know. Netflix, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it is, it, it is about, it like, is you know, basic, basic living. living. <laughs> it's basic living. Yeah, of course. So, so they, were spending, they were spending their illegal gains, mm. like, you know, so, so those cash cards, yeah. um, they were using those cash cards that they got back out of the system to essentially do the basic shopping and so forth. Yeah. Um, after that, you know, it was all about pleasure. Oh. Like, you know, and mm. hey, these, these guys, criminals, um, so it's about drugs, prostitution, um, anything, any kind of deviancy, you know, they were using 20% of it for, you know, he found for like deviant activities or, you know, okay. something Fair like enough. that. Fair enough. Um, luxuries um, was the next. Now this is where we really start to get into the, the, the real money laundering aspect. Um, because the other parts up to this point is kind of like cash flow type stuff. You know, oh, yeah. it, it's like it's in, it's out, it's spent, it's gone. Okay, the luxuries, the the value, the the jewelry, the sports car, the fancy watch, the nice vacations, um, nice vacations. Yachts, maybe. Uh, yeah, they're going to move into the assets because they can appreciate. Oh yeah, of course, yeah. yeah to appreciable yeah. yeah well I think so or yeah. are they or do they go the other way I'm not so oh, sure the cars, you know, yeah. you drive it off I don't the have a, I don't have a yacht <laughs> <laughs> so, oh. I don't know oh, yeah. but but what well, you, could, you could join me on mine yeah. uh, <laughs> you wish yeah but but things like watches like you know if you buy the right watch mm. like you know that's actually an asset as well so it's not only luxury goods it's sure. also an asset so um, so you know I can buy a nice Cartier but if I keep it you know it's gonna appreciate in value yeah. So he was, you know, his research came out that 15% of the money that cyber criminals got was, was spent on, like, you know, luxury goods. Okay. Now, now we move into assets. And this is, you know, this is the big one. Because really, this is about disguising, you know, your gains in a way that, you know, you can kind of, you can get some legitimate revenue, ultimately. Mm -hmm. um, so there's been a, a massive amount of focus on things such as like you know residential property um, business property um, commercial property and so forth yeah. you know so you know I used to live in Dubai and I was there during the the massive property boom that was in Dubai and you know a massive amount of it you would see these huge towers that would be totally empty and there were legitimate speculators but obviously the huge uh, rumor was that a significant amount of illegal funds, you know, oh. illegal money had Incredible. gone into to buying those empty towers um, so that ultimately could be sold for a profit. 
Yeah. Of course, yeah. So, so property is obviously a good one, um, particularly in unregulated markets. Um, other one is art. You know, art's a great one for the money launderer. Um, like and the reason why art's a great one is because the value is up to the buyer. So what that means is if I want to launder money, so say, you know, I've got a million of illegal cash. Yep. So I buy a piece of art at a million dollars. But ultimately, I can sell that piece of art, perhaps if I keep it a few years, it could be two million, three million, four million, because it's, you know, it's kind of, it's, it's grown in awareness, there's people who kind of love it now, and so forth. Hmm. Uh, and, you know, the other aspect of it is, is who are you to tell me that that, that piece of art was not worth four million? You know, so I could just be another laundry. It could just be another part of the chain. Yeah, could I? Could I? Let's say buy that piece of art for a million and then sell it to my money laundering friends for four million because you owe me three yep. million. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And you know, and well, I that would be a clean transaction, of course, because obviously you love. I my love. Art. You love. My I love art. art. Right? Yeah, it's fantab- <laughs> fabulous. But yeah, so you know, so art's another uh, is a great one. So. The other one that I've got here that I put down, and this is like, you know, it's obviously a new one. This is um, Crypto Kitty, and this particular one was, um, it was sold, um, it was like really a digital piece of art, and it was sold, I think, for, I think it was 140K, you know. So there's now, it's not just physical assets, there are indeed digital assets that are worth a massive amount of money. That's pretty cool. It's a pretty cool kitty. Yeah. I mean, rare, rare. One of a kind, I think. <laughs> well, I think definitely one of a kind. Yeah. But, but the important point is that there are now, as the, the economy moves on, there is now a massive amount of digital assets that are out there that can be bought and sold, which actually don't touch the physical world. Um, That's true. So, so the controls yeah. around those online marketplaces um, are very different. Um, yeah. And, you know, we take gaming, um, South Korea. Um, I did an article not too long ago on LinkedIn, and it was about the price of gaming gold. Oh, yeah. And you can actually, okay, say you've got 100 gold pieces, there's, there's actually an exchange which tells you how much a gaming gold piece is worth in the real world. So you can buy, say, 14 virtual gold coins in a massive multiplayer role-playing game, um, and it's got a real-world value, and you can pay for that. Yeah. Now, the problem is those virtual, like you know, gaming worlds. Um, there's been a, a big sort of, you know, there's been a big look at those because actually, it's exchange of value again, and if ultimately I can get some real-world value out of that then for me as a, you know, I'm the, the, the big money laundering guy, I'm like, hey, you know what? I see. You know, I can buy with my Bitcoin a load of virtual goods in one of these huge uh, multiplayer games, and then ultimately I can sell them onto somebody for real money. So essentially, any store of value or exchange of value is able to be exactly. leveraged. Exactly, exactly. So whether that be fiat currency, cryptocurrency, in-game currency, anything that you can exchange for some value in the future. Exactly. It's susceptible exactly. to exactly. And, and, and that's why there's this concern and you know, there's authorities are now like, you know, massively focusing in on this because you know, the regulation, the tools, the tracking, uh, that's gonna uh, be difficult. the measures, you know, and you think of the speed of those exchanges processing those different transactions mm. Um, you know, is huge. Oh yeah. Um, you know, put it this way: even organisations, banks that have got huge global networks. Um, and let's not get confused, okay? You know, the the number of financial transactions that go on in the real world, in you know, over fiat currency. Significantly larger. Yeah, you know, it's significantly course. larger. So, I, so we don't want to kind of like you know wave the white flag just yet. No. Yeah. You know. But it, it's obviously it's a it's a new frontier. And anytime exactly. You know, a new frontier, uh, it's going to be leveraged. So, so that's kind of, you know, it's one of the big concerns. And then the final thing that he came up with was that 20% of um, the cash that was, um, you know, kind of gained 
um, would be spent on tools and crime. So in other words, this was funding the next job. Oh, well, um, well, yeah, I mean, obviously with any business, you need to reinvest. You reinvest your money. <laughs> you you know? reinvest to, yeah, yeah. to continue. Yeah, uh, exactly. Otherwise, the business doesn't grow. Right? Exactly. I'm a criminal businessman. Yeah. You know? I thought um, I was a criminal businessman. Oh, yeah, you can be the criminal <laughs> businessman. It was like um, um, there was that TV show, The Wire, from years ago. Hmm. I don't know if you ever, ever watched it, but um, there was one of the characters in that, and he was doing an MBA, and he was applying his business MBA to um, essentially a drug dealing network. Um, and that kind of like, you know, it, it just kind of shows that, you know, all of this now is yeah. the criminal is learning, the, the professional criminal, the organized gangs, um, specialist skill sets, business acumen, you know, it's the same skill set, yeah. just applied to a different world. Yeah, even the organized crime has an MBA. Right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Crime does yeah. pay. <laughs> so, um, You'll figure let's, let's, so that's kind of money laundering to give you an idea of some of the things that can happen, you know, how cyber criminals are using um, the kind of the cash that they gain, whether it be through cryptocurrency, um, whether it be through some online fraud or whatever it is and how they're kind of getting that money out. Right. Right. Um, so I think, you know, let's, um, let's talk about some things that we think, you know, we would recommend to, to people yeah, to kind I mean, of look at. So, I mean, you know, given the fact that, that crime pays, how do, we, how do we prevent crime from paying, right? Exactly. I think that's the next point, right? Yeah. yeah. And let's, uh, let's take some measures or, you know, suggest some things. Exactly. Let's do that.